Hello, hello, hello. I'm Maron Khalili and this is Frontline, a series of interviews where I talk with activists, organizers, or just regular people who have confronted the establishment to figure out how they do it. And in today's interview, which was recorded on November the 4th, 2022, I talk with Simon Howard. He's one of the organizers of the Don't Pay UK campaign for a massive payment strike on December the 1st. And he explains a lot about the inner workings of the campaign in this interview. He, we talk about the tools they use, how they went from nothing to 250,000 signatures in just a couple of months with 32,000 organizers. Simon was very generous with his time. He was very, very open about the mechanics of the campaign. And I think there's a lot to learn from in this interview. So without further ado, I bring you Simon Howard. I'm I'm a UK citizen and I work in the building trade. Okay, and you're very involved in the Don't Pay UK campaign um, to to ask people to withhold their energy bills, uh, basically a payment strike. Yep. Um, tell me a bit about that. Like, like what's the what is the situation that has created the need for this strike? We've been dealing in, in the UK, we've been dealing with an ongoing cost of living crisis um, as wages stagnate and inflation has let rip. Um, one of the more obvious aspects of this has been um, the massive increase in energy bills. Uh, the, the maximum amount that the energy companies are allowed to charge households is calculated according to an equation. Um, in the run up to October, this campaign started in June. So it started on June the 18th, 2022. Uh, we'd already had massive price rises in energy in April. Uh, a lot of the energy suppliers uh, had gone bust and been taken over by the government or amalgamated or people have been forced to switch companies. Um, so people's energy bills were very, already very high. Um, and then another massive increase looked like it was going to happen in October, um, possibly tripling or quadrupling people's energy bills. Um, some people, a group of friends in London, I believe, I didn't get involved till two or three weeks later, um, I saw it on Facebook and got involved. Um, people uh, got together and thought, well, let's, you know, we can organise a payment strike on this. Genuine leverage here in that everyone is individually responsible for their own bill. We could, um, if we pulled everyone together, we already knew that um, with the increase in prices, particularly predicted October increases, that tens if not hundreds of thousands of people are already not going to be able to pay um, and that we were going to try and crystallise this into a political moment, not, not allow people to be individually picked off. Uh, but turn it into political movement. And that's how Don't Pay started. The energy companies, Shell, BP, they're all making a killing, right? I mean, we, uh, I, I've got some stats in front of me that Shell has doubled their profits from 2021 uh, and made $8.2 billion in the last three months. BP also doubled uh, compared to the same period of last year in terms of profits. So the bills are, you're saying, tripling and quadrupling. And the profits of the energy companies are <laughs> ex expanding. What what's going what's going on there a little bit? Well, I mean, I mean, you, I, mean you, I think we all guess what's going on there. But I think that the situation we have here, uh, and that might be might be very different to other parts of Europe. Um, the situation we have here is that we have a one of these rigged false markets in this country. So you've got the people who mine and extract the energy, the the, great, the big energy giants. Um, and then you have the people you actually get your electricity bill from uh, and supply the energy. And this was all deregulated, very Thatcherite, big bang economics. Um, so you have all these companies that you can switch between and you know, look for bargains or whatever in this kind of free market. There isn't one because when the crunch actually came and the unit price went up, these companies all ended up offering the same deal. And many of them went bust because they offered on very slim margins. So what we've always said is don't pay is that we need to get rid of this rigged market entirely and be dealing directly with the energy giants who are banking billion-dollar profits uh, quarter on quarter, almost to the point where senior figures within the industry have demanded to be taxed um, because the situation is so ludicrous, the imbalance is so ludicrous, um, and I think they can, they can see that the social unrest that will follow from energy bills increasing to this extent. The Don't Pay campaign. Top line, like what... What are your demands? The the top um, three three demands is that it should have been um, the first, certainly pre-October, no energy price hike in October. That's what we demanded. 
um, and, and in fact, a return to the April 2021 prices. So, so attacking the price rise, the, the doubling that had happened in April 2022. That was on demand. Um, that there should be no enforcement of prepayment meters, but this is the, the primary method um, of, of cowing people is being put on a prepayment meter. Most of us pay our uh, electricity uh, our, and our gas in arrears, um, but they actually, if you get on a prepayment meter, then you're obviously, you have no possibility of withdrawing payment or budgeting. You simply have to go and add money whenever you need power. And not only that, the majority of companies charge you more per unit. Um, so we want no enforcement of prepayment meters. And that's across the board. That includes existing ones. And then the third demand is that no one should be cold this winter. And I hope no one, because this is, um, we've actually had a, had a mild winter so far, but it, the temperatures are going down now. So we can we can see that. And this is, I hope, a chance for us to address the ongoing inequality, that we actually have a proper conversation here about a fair price for power in the UK. At the moment, the less electricity you use, the less power you use, the more you're paying per unit. And that's completely unfair. We, we need to be looking at that and ensuring that everyone can afford to heat and eat. And if that involves um, higher rates for people who can afford it in higher energy bands, then so be it. The tactic of just simply not paying. This was something that was based on the successful um, rebellion against Margaret Thatcher's poll tax. Uh, when was that? 30, 30 years ago or so. Um, 1991. Yeah. 1991. Yeah. Um, well, so it was a three year campaign, actually, to be fair. Um, <laughs> but yeah, go on. Okay. But <coughs> explain a bit about that and the idea of pledging as opposed to just going on strike because that's how your campaign um works or at least has up to now just saying that we will look like a warning like hey hey energy companies we're going to st stop paying if you don't meet our demands but without actually doing it yet well that's right i think we needed to build a, a critical mass of people uh we already knew uh that that as i say tens if not hundreds of thousands of people were going to be in cut the can't pay bracket people already on prepayment meters and so on and so forth so build a safety in numbers to, to make it quite clear that there was no way they could take us all to court. There's no way they could enforce a prepayment meter on all of us and that they were going to have to take notice of this. And we know they did. I mean, this is what's been really interesting um, is that there have been documents that have come out, freedom of information and, and some leaks have shown that the energy companies were directly lobbying the government, effectively saying, this is going to work. This is going to work. This has gone viral, which, which it did. Um, enormous response, absolutely enormous response really resonated um and they were this is and we had a lever we had an effective lever against these people because it was an action that people could take at quite a low bar of entry so just to cancel your direct debit you don't even get a letter for 28 days but if if thousands of people did that at once that creates an enormous cash flow com problem for the companies um and that that process that was working so without doing anything at all you know the most powerful punch is often the one that's not thrown without doing anything at all we steered um, Truss's government into uh, scrapping the October price hike. Um, so it, it worked. And uh, whether we took our inspiration from the poll tax or about other examples uh, more recently in Kent, actually, which is a very um, conservative right-wing uh, part of the country, or votes consistently conservative, um, people uh, engaged in a mass payment strike there uh, last summer over the sewage being dumped on the beaches by southern water and that was effective in effect the southern water wrote off loads of people's energy uh, sorry uh, water bills water bills are typically much lower um than, than mm. you know gas or electric but nonetheless they were forced to back off by thousands of people in a small area um deciding that they weren't going to pay which is quite an interesting example and i think it, that was one of the interesting things about don't pay if i can digress slightly was the fact that it was starting to resonate well outside the usual lefty areas. That was right. You, in the you had shires, basically. Right. Uh, it, you had some right wing commentators, Katie Hopkins and some other people uh, uh, like that, sort of endorsing the campaign. Um, <clears throat> and as you said, you, you, you there were these documents, I, I think it was in October, um, that showed that the energy companies were very worried specifically about your campaign. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a slide, I think I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. at this piece on from open democracy, where they made a slide 
um, uh, I, I forget who the presentation was to. Maybe it was, oh, it was sent to Tory ministers saying the don't pay campaign. <laughs> what is going to be your response if this campaign goes ahead? And they actually have, uh, they've cut and pasted from your site. So it's, I mean, it's very encouraging that you're kind of registering on the, the establishment. Um, oh, well, I, th I think they must have been, folk, you know, as they do, the, you know, the, they must have been hearing it in their constituency surgeries. Um, you know, we spoke to spoken to trade union leaders who were saying it's the membership who are coming up and talking to us about this. You know, we we were getting, you know, WhatsApp groups. We can talk about the mechanics of how the campaign works in a bit, but we were certainly getting interest in like, you know, rural areas where nothing radicals happened since the Civil War. You know, it's it was sort of um Oh, for the benefit of anyone, anyway, we haven't had we haven't had a civil war for four hundred years. So, um, the so, but it, that's that's one that was really interesting here, and it was not it was outside outside the unionised left, um, and I think they could see it was growing. So I think their focus groups were telling them that this was growing and was really catching on, um, and they, they had to swerve very rapidly, and I think in quite a disorganised fashion. Um, they didn't come up with the best response to it, um, and in fact, that you know cause the problems which cause the collapse of the government effectively the energy price guarantee your first demand has not fully been met though uh, right uh and that was your first demand was a return to the pre-april prices you are right they basically all they did was scrap the october price hike they didn't return to which is yeah it's a partial victory um definitely i think it, it showed just what what can actually be done um you know if you get enough people together um and, and and actually quite you know a low resource campaign really was effectively able to steer the government in that way by tapping into a public mood and um i don't again it, it was interesting what you said about katie hopkins i don't know if you want to talk about that later but that was other things i've heard from other european um activists other people i've spoken to since getting involved in this is that we took this ground for the left we and that's Crucial, I think we. I mean, there's been a lot of criticisms of the Don't Pay campaign in terms of whether it's democratic, how organised it is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, we didn't spend, you know, a year polishing a model, the perfect model of how this campaign was going to turn out. We grabbed the ball and ran with it, and I think that was really important because it, it's quite clear that some of the fringe right wing populist characters in this country were already thinking about a Don't Pay campaign. They were already thinking about. Uh, cost of living crisis and we know what their answers to the cost of living crisis would have been would have been attacks on the concept of net zero it would have been about the return yeah. of fracking it would have been anti-immigration yeah, and immigration, this is yeah. this is what we're talking would have been talking about if these people have been allowed to seize the initiative so i think we reacted quickly and possibly imperfectly um but nonetheless we had the initiative so the conversation yeah. was about what we wanted it to be about which is about fossil fuels it was about profits so we, we united that on a class basis mm. not a you know a national basis perhaps you're pushing ahead you, you're, you're there's you've got 250,000 people so far uh, more than 250,000 who've pledged to strike you originally were going to strike um on uh, October the 1st but you've pushed it back to December the 1st so tell me a bit about the tactics that have essentially like you said the, the campaign started in June I mean it's a decentralized campaign all these people have suddenly got together you've obviously had a lot of uh, um, a lot of media interest and even some political wins for a, a campaign with that's so young um, basically it's it's quite remarkable Tell me a bit about how it worked, how, well, how I suppose, it, the mechanics of it. Yeah, so I suppose the important thing, and I sort of said this from the beginning, um, we are not building this movement, we're channeling it. And I think that's important to understand is that one of the reasons I got involved, um, not only because our energy bills went to the roof, one of the reasons I got involved was because I was hearing this conversation on the school run. I was hearing it at work. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? Um, you know, so th this... You know, it was a conversation the whole country was already having. And it was our job effectively to stick up a lightning rod and channel that down into a political movement. Um, and, that, and that's a very different thing to trying to build something from scratch. Um, so I think I think that's that's where we're at. And I think it um 
In terms of the developments, obviously, we didn't go on strike on October the 1st because our first demand had been partially met. And and this is, um, nothing is perfect, you know? This is, this is a fight, you know? And so so it's, you know, the, the, your opponent will do unexpected things that you then have to respond to. And that, that is very much what's happened here. I haven't got a great deal of faith in this government, if I'm brutally honest. Um, but they are going to have to come up with a solution. We have the people power. Um, we already know that millions of people. So this was the other thing. It wasn't just the campaign, but polling showed that up to 3 million people were talking about cancelling their direct debits. Coming uh -huh. to it was huge. So the poll, so there was a kind of gap perhaps between people who just went to the point and pledged and where the idea just lodged in people's head. And we had effectively created a social license to stop paying your energy bills. So, yeah. I mean, you know, that, that kind of critical mass you reach where millions of people are doing it so I can do it and it's very low risk, which I think is, is what you're trying to create as a moment. And I think we had penetrated to the point where that had happened. Can you explain the risks that are involved? Some people are worried about their credit rating um, and, and that you can end up in court. But presumably the idea is that if so many people do this at, in one go, um, it's going to just, the system's going to grind to a halt. It's going to clog up the whole um, court system. And, and yeah. uh, it's, it, they, it, like it's not feasible. What really are the risks um, for, for individuals? I mean, the, yeah, so the risk, the, the risk is actually quite low um, in the sense that um, if you, you're on direct debit, which the majority of people pay their, their risk by direct debit, if you, if you cancel that, you know, you don't. You get a letter after 28 days. You get invited to pay. There's quite a lengthy process they get to before you get anywhere near court. Um, so it's and and at that point, you, you know, you can you can get off the train whenever you want, if you know what I mean. So a kind mm. of a rolling blockade, a mass foot dragging, would work equally well with with you know to, to the actual sort of you know it's a very wide spectrum of going on strike. What we're asking people to do is cancel the direct debits. To, to attack the cash flow of these companies and force them, as worked very well, to go to the government. So, what's your solution? Um, but it's 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 a and, and I think that's what's got them spooked because the actual cost they've got people under isn't isn't a very strong one um, mm -hmm. because it's like well they can write you a letter and the debt collectors yeah if you if you wanted to string the whole thing out for six months absolutely refuse to pay um, you you can choose to have your day in court etc cetera, etc cetera, then you could you could so easily clog the system up. Um, not very many people could do that. You know, it wouldn't take very many people doing it to do that um, and to make the idea go viral. But if everyone demanded their day in court, um, that would slow the whole system down. And the whole point is if you could demand your day in court and then and then pay the day before if you wanted mm. to and then still have created this massive uh, backlog and harassment for the companies and uncertainty, which is what we're trying to do. But as you say, that only works when when people really feel that they're not alone and that they're part of a of, of a wave of um, of action. I think the campaign has been brilliant at creating that th that sense of look. It's 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 us. It's about us on the site. You've got tips for how to help people in need. Uh, you've you've got uh, lists of helplines that people can call if they're struggling to pay their bills. Um, information about mental health, etc. I mean, it's it's really you get the sense from from all of the, the copy around this campaign all the messaging that this is just pe regular people who who can't do anything else they're being pushed to their limit they don't really want to do this but hell we're going to do this because they're not leaving us any any um any other option that's actually what has happened i mean yeah it started by a small kernel a small group of people very rapidly, people have, have come into this. Actually, from quite a wide range of political backgrounds have, have come into this, or, or basically, it's not even political backgrounds, you know, not political activists, people with different sets of assumptions perhaps have come in and, and fed into this. It's a very basic message, easy to understand, directly addresses a kind of material need in people's lives. And as I say, it went, went viral. I tried to, to sign up a um, couple of days ago just to understand the onboarding process, if you like, of people and you you go there you you enter your postcode you enter your email address and it uses whatsapp as a kind of backbone in terms of keeping um, people connected yeah. 
which is a is a great choice. I mean, it's a, it's relatively platform independent. It's in your pocket. Um, you don't have to be a be a member and log in and, and whatever. I mean, people have already got this 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 app on their phones. If there is an existing WhatsApp group in, in your postcode for your postcode, then you're directed to it. If there isn't, you're directed to create one. Um, take take. I mean, explain that choice and where does it go from there in terms of um, getting people organised using that that system? There's sort of two levels to this. One is pledging. And the other is agreeing to be an organizer. I think 32,000 people signed up for sort of the next level up, which is being an organizer. Um, and what that effectively meant is you would be put together with people in your area based on postcode that you'd entered in a WhatsApp group. Um, and that then you would then basically be left to, and there's been a certain amount of work put into this, to then link up with the other WhatsApp groups around you in the area and create um, you know, bigger, bigger structures. Um, and it, it's been interesting because some some WhatsApp groups are very active, some some not. Um, so that and that's been, but it has worked because we have three hundred active uh, WhatsApp groups, and we when we have called for uh, decentralised protests as we did in October the first, they popped up in all sorts of places, and so people have been left to come up with their own messaging, do their own recruitment. Um, so it's it's been it's completely decentralised in that sense. So I think it started. We threw the WhatsApp groups out there. And as the campaign uh, goes on, it's a matter of, of trying to integrate those into a structure that's growing from those WhatsApp groups back up, which is kind of what's happening now. So there's regional meetings that are going on in different parts of the country. Um, so no sort of central the, – the, the central website and so on and so forth is all just run by a small group, but there's more and more input coming from people who've arrived at the campaign through joining one of these WhatsApp groups. I mean, let's take that protest as an example. Um, you, the there was a call for protest. I, I forget when a few weeks ago, right? Uh, October the first. October the first. Sorry, yeah, right. But it was a. But there was a, it was a, there was a protest. It was a. You were asking people to burn their bills. Correct. That so so you replaced the October the first strike with an October the first bill burning protest, right? Yeah. Okay. Now what I saw there was that there was you had. Uh, sort of centralized kind of f i know I, i'm getting into the nitty-gritty a bit of how it works sure. here but like you had some graphics that people could print um and an, an example of what it could look like the the protest and this was all this this was a, a i think a, um, on the website or, or or a pdf i forget and also all of the legal um advice like you won't get in trouble for for burning some burning some pieces of paper kind of thing i mean all, all the questions that people could have were effectively answered at that point like hey well i haven't done this before could i get in trouble for doing that etc so i mean it was just a symbolic protest but burning imaginary bills or or, or real bills i mean you gave people the choice um so like very difficult to set fire to an email sadly but there we go. Um, <laughs> yes but yeah, it was. <laughs> but so tell yeah, me about was, that. How, how did it end? How did it end up going? I mean, like, like you, you know, it went really well. Going? I mean, what what we did was join in with um, or go as a block on. Um, so so, and there's another campaign in the UK called Enough Is Enough, uh, which is a trade union uh, led campaign uh, trying to kind of inspire uh, non unionized backing for for the strikes that are going on at the moment. Um, so they also called um, an action on October the first um across the country um so in effect we, we joined in with that um across the country and um people took their burning barrels to those protests and encouraged people to, to burn their energy bills there um and, and other people did it independently but there were dozens across the country that did it okay and how do you i mean one of the things that we we <laughs> always struggle with in terms of this decentralized campaigning idea is that People can come in, kind of co-opt the um, the cause. You get people that are searching for political power or to raise their own profile. Um, how do you deal with that? How how do you instruct people to deal with that or guide people to deal with that? Because that's an inevitable part of any kind of political group or campaigning. How do you how do you handle it? It's a really good. I mean, that is a really good question. And then so far, we've not been. 
really confronted with any uh, any major difficulties. I think one of the interesting things actually has been, uh, this is me speaking personally, actually, it's been the, the big overlap with um, what is a huge belief system actually here, which is the anti-lockdown, um, anti-vax belief system. Um, without going, you know, the, the big, it's a very complicated uh, phenomena. It's a sort of a massive Venn diagram of overlapping beliefs, some truly noxious, some not, some based on anti-authoritarianism. It's really interesting, but it is huge. Uh, and I think often the left doesn't, doesn't look at that. And it's something that the right populists are happy to look at and exploit. And we've had a lot of people just for them, that's their common sense that have come in uh, to various WhatsApp groups. So it's probably been the major challenge is dealing with that, having a policy, trying to have a say to people, look, um, you know, we might we might not agree on on you know on, on everything or indeed anything else, but we're here for one purpose. So a very clear, this is what we're here for. We are here for energy bills, and and not getting beyond that has has kind of helped keep the campaign on track. As I say, and I think it's actually the seeding of a campaign, the sort of the base assumptions that go into it from the very small group of people who set it up, they're not there centrally directing it anymore. Um. But that, that that sort of built into it from the beginning. It's in its DNA, basically, and that I think was very important. Um, and that that has a, I don't know if there's any sort of political power to be gained from don't pay um, from from co-opting it. Maybe there is. I don't know. How do you marry that um, that decentralized model that you just described? You said I mean the people that originally set it up are, are, are no longer. I mean it's 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 running on its own steam now, effectively. With, I mean, let's take let's take a given take. You know, there's a protest, okay, and there's some media that are coming there, mm -hmm. and we know that there's going to be some buzz and the social media hashtag, mm -hmm. etc. And it's a protest that you've organised, mm -hmm. and then suddenly a load of people show up with their own banner about something else, you know, mm -hmm. um, looking to looking to get in on some of that um, on some of that profile uh, raising. How do you how do you handle that? Like, if it's decentralised. How do you go? Look, sorry, guys. Um, no, this is not. This is not going to work. Like, how, what kind of? Well, in, in effect, we we couldn't. I mean, I think you're right. That is a potential weakness of the model. Um, gen genuinely, I think I think you're right. That that sort of thing could happen, or we could have a a rogue don't pay group um, quite easily. That that could be that could happen. Um, uh, you know, that, that somebody could be in in a WhatsApp group and have politics who were completely opposed to mine. Um, and how you know that that would be something to grapple with. I think um, I think possibly streamlining the media appearances through one office. That's that's been good. So we had an enormous amount of mainstream uh, media interest uh, at the beginning, um, and there was a spokesperson program. So you get actual authentic voices rather than sort of um, the sort of semi celebrity influencer left wing spokesperson model, which we've had in the UK up till now um really right so we've we sort of bypassed that and tried to get people from local groups uh from different areas different backgrounds and get them to be our spokespeople so you you would very there's no one face associated with don't pay uk which is a real strength of it i think um it's it I mean, you go on the site there's not this sort of usual kind of about section with a load of people and their cvs uh faces and uh you know nice nice photos yeah <laughs> so, I, so i i think i think that's some um, i think that's very powerful but then that brings me to a question about, about money how do you pay for basic things like materials and for the for the protests so lo local groups fundraise so we've definitely done that um there was a lot of donations came in actually um uh, the, the beginning, not like it's a very low budget camp, but I'm um, by you know, I don't know, let's sort of pick an example a Greenpeace or something that would um spend millions on, on a campaign. Um, you know, it's not like that at all. I think we're talking in the low tens of thousands have been spent, I mean, low, probably under 30 grand all told, uh, has been spent on this campaign. Um, but yeah, donations came in at the beginning, um, quite a lot and certainly more, more, more than people were expecting, so that's enabled the um. But that's all gone straight back out. I mean, millions of leaflets, hundreds of thousands of stickers um, were printed, distributed free of charge um, to people or for a nominal fee. Um, and that's that's where the money went. I see. Okay. And and what's the future then for, for Don't Pay? Because you've got 250 
thousand people who have pledged after the December the first strike, whatever happens, what what what's the next step? <laughs> I mean, obviously, so it depends very much on the fork on the road is going to be what do they do about energy bills? That, that's going to be the big fork in the road. Um, and, and yeah, I, I can't, I will be, but personally speaking, I'm going to be quite surprised if something, they're not going to let it rip again. I They're very unlikely, I feel, that the government is going to walk into exactly the same trap as they did in October the 1st, where they were forced into a panicked response. That, that seems that they're not going to do that. They will address this in some way. And then we will have to address that. That seems to me the likeliest outcome. You know, let's see what comes out in this mini budget. Let's see what they're proposing come April. Whether we call off or go on strike uh, on December the 1st um, will be dependent on that, what, what's on the table. Um, I don't know to what extent, you know, so personally, I suppose I hope this doesn't sort of ossify into anything. I think this is a moment. We've channeled this movement. Um, I hope we've shown, and the example is what I'd like to shout from the rooftops, is this works. You know, actually, you know, the, the powers that be are not as powerful as you think they are. And if you get enough people together and you do this and you you work in a decentralised way, then you can win. And with quite low resources, if you, if you pick your moments, you can win. And that's what I'd like, that's what would would like the takeaway to be for people. Now, whatever coalitions or ideas or whatever come after this and we are still looking whatever happens um with this mini budget or the next year we're looking at and, and there's no promise coming from uh from the labor party either really other than just more years of austerity that's what we're looking at and, and the sort of continual trajectory into crisis after crisis our societies are experiencing i'm hoping that people can learn it if you band together and, and act in, in this way you know we can win and we can win for you know people further down the social scale that change is possible okay um well that's great let, let, i mean i i'd like to i'm conscious of time here mm. so could you just tell for the benefit of people listening um tell them what are the first steps to for people to get involved with don't pay resources points of contact etc so um really so please involved. visit our website don't pay.uk um, pledge. Well, read the resources first and decide if it's for you, but then pledge. Um, it doesn't matter if you're on a prepayment, whatever your situation is, just pledge, join in, um, help organize, help spread the strike. Um, and that's, that's what I'd like people to do. Great. Simon Howard, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's been fascinating talking to you and best of luck with the campaign. Really appreciate you, uh, coming in today and, and, and opening the opening the, the hood to explain how it all works and good luck with it. Thank you very much.